Bob Seale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it is a genuine privilege to follow the right of the honourable member from Bristol North West, who I think spoke very eloquently, and it was a pleasure to listen to him. Um, I also thank the Minister for being here and to listening to us. Not every minister is impressive, but I think this one undoubtedly is. And last but not least, no. it is a, a privilege to, to be with the two Canadian units or representatives of the two Canadian units and the Australian unit who are here in the gallery. My great great uncle was the last member of my family to represent my seat, which is the Isle of Wight. I have a huge privilege to represent. And he served in World War I with the Canadian uh, cavalry. In fact, he led the Canadian Cavalry Brigade in World War I. And at Vimy Ridge, earlier this year, which was remembered in, uh, in France, it was the Canadian Cavalry charge that halted the German advance and saved the splitting of the Allied forces and possibly the war in March 1918. Um, and he was very proud of his service with the Canadian Cavalry. He was a Brit from the Isle of Wight. Um, but he was associated with the, with the brigade. So it's a pleasure for them to be here, for, a pleasure for me to be here with them. Um, I, I would like to talk briefly about two things. Firstly, what is Global Britain? And then some points about the international order which relate to China and Iran and Russia. Firstly, on Global Britain, I, I, I don't wish to be overcritical to the minister who I have high regard for. Global Britain is a great phrase, but we really need to fill it out. There are some questions that I have about it. Uh, what are we prioritising? Every time our Foreign Affairs Committee says, what are you prioritising, it's everything. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the FCO doesn't have unlimited resources. Global Britain is more than just opening half a dozen extra posts in Papua New Guinea. It has to amount to something. Is it trade priority? Is it aid? Is it security? For the last 15 years, we've had a foreign policy which has been somewhat gesture politics, much more in the world besides. But in the last five years, foreign affairs, threats to Britain, our role in the world, these have become much more serious, urgent and pressing questions. And I think there is a strong argument for saying our clarity has to be on trade and their security and on aid. That is not to underestimate the importance of aid, but it is to see that actually we have vital national interests that we have to try to meet. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Point. Uh, I, I thank him for giving way as the, one of the co-chairs of the Trade Out of Poverty, APPG. Would he agree with me that actually trade, aid and uh, global security are three legs of the same stool and success in those three can actually be a mutually reinforcing thing? You make a very good point. I think my answer to that is they can be, but not necessarily. It is dependent on how the money is spent. And I will come to that a little bit later, but they are not separate. That is certainly true. But it is how we deal with those as a whole that is the issue. Um, next question. What, is there, what role is there for the Anglosphere? We talk about deepening relationships with Canada, with, with Australia, with New Zealand, with the United States. What does this mean in practice? Is there a role for a global NATO and a NATO that looks not only at physical force, but threats to democracy from cyber attack and from other organisations like, and from criminal and state actors. What should the structure of the FCO be after Brexit? I'm quite a fan of the argument to suggest that the FCO should be a super ministry and having an oversight, a stronger role leading defence and DFID, which I'm glad that the, the, the minister has just signed up to. Um, <laughs> Uh, di and uh, DIT and DFID and Defence, because there are so and the Cabinet Office and the Prime Minister's Office, there are so many bits of government which are now involved in foreign affairs. We want coherence, and above all, I think the critical thing that we need to learn is how we integrate government better, not only here but critically at home to deliver efficiently. I do not like Russia's hybrid war, but it is an incredibly efficient use of power. I'm not saying that is our model, but efficiency and integration are important. We need to rebalance our overseas spending. I do not believe the 0.7% should be dictated, how that 0.7% is spent should be dictated by the OSCE. I think we should dictate how we spend that. There's an argument to suggest that the BBC, which is part of the broader aid budget, should be entirely funded through DFID, as should all peacekeeping operations, which are fundamental elements of aid. I will give way. Thank you. Friend, very kindly giving way, and uh, forgive me for intruding, but just for a moment. Would he agree with me that the establishment of truth and facts is one of the fundamentals to building fair societies? 
and therefore the BBC's role is not simply informative but actually is fundamental to the democratic survival of our partners and allies. Yes, I mean, one of the points I'm coming to later, which I, I thank the, the, my, my honourable friend for mentioning, is that we are in a global struggle at the moment with authoritarian states that wish to use both cyber but also open societies to undermine those open societies and the freedoms that we have. And therefore, to see the BBC endlessly begging for money, the World Service, radio and TV, I think is, is, is again, a luxury that we can't afford. So I do believe that we should rebalance overseas spending, respecting aid, but redefining how it is done. Fifthly, do we have a grand strategy? Is grand strategy a thing of the past? It feels like too much that we are simply muddling through with a foreign policy. We have stumbled into Brexit, and I voted for Brexit, but we have stumbled into it. The European Union has treated this like the mother of all vicious divorces, when we have uh, sort of treated it like flat share, go, a flat share partnership where we are all going our separate ways. And I do think that if we stumble into what global Brexit is, it is not going to be particularly helpful to our future. So those are just some questions. I will be working on these themes as well and writing about it as I have done today in Conservative Home. And I would be grateful. I know that the Foreign Office and other parts of our government are very focused on Brexit. In fact, politically, our political classes are obsessed by it to the diminishment of a domestic agenda, which I think is extremely serious in its own right. But more thinking on, 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 on global Britain would not go amiss. To come to the point that the, my honourable friend, the, the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, raised, the international order is under threat. And, um, sorry, do you want me to give way? Are you getting a glass of water? I'm getting a glass of water. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 Just, one, one never knows. You'll know when I want you to. Well, I, thought, I thought you were waving earlier. I thought the, the minister was waving earlier. I thought he was just being friendly and agreeing with me as, as ever. <laughs> the, the international order is not being helped by President Trump, whose actions are deeply rash and foolish. However, the main structural threat to the international order comes from those authoritarian states that are trying to break down the current system. And as I said, one of the key battles that we face is how we protect the future of open and free societies against those states that want to undermine them. China is doing it gently, Russia and Iran much more aggressively. But China, although it is being more subtle, subtle the aims are somewhat the same. It doesn't have Russia's little green men, but it has little blue men pushing the maritime boundaries. It has claims in the South China Sea. It has tried to change the law of the seas. It is building artificial islands. It is offering loans to Vanuatu and other, Vanuatu, sorry, and other Pacific states, and is building up an unhealthy degree of influence in New Zealand and Australian politics some of it corrupt. So to that, we need global as well as Atlantic and European alliances. So that makes me raise the question, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, has been a force for good in our area. Does it need to be extended to have a global front? I think next, the international order is not perfect, but it is worth defending. But one of the things that is changing and making it more difficult for the international order to work is the nature of warfare. Conventional warfare is becoming rare. Forms of non-conventional warfare are becoming much more common. Indeed, one of my roles in the military when I, was, when I was serving in it was to understand these new forms of unconventional war. This has put significant pressure on the norms of war. So, for example, in Syria, the Syrian war, now in its seventh year, may arguably be the first in history when hospitals and medical facilities are the primary and indeed the priority targets for the Syrian regime backed by the Russians. Yesterday in this House, we talked a great deal about bringing to justice people in Myanmar. There is an embarrassing degree of silence in the Western world about naming Russian regiments, Russian planes that are dropping bombs on hospitals. We would you join me with, with me in hoping that the International Criminal Court will eventually indict those responsible for what are, in effect, war crimes that are happening in Syria? Yeah, absolutely, and I thank, I thank, you for that. I, I thank my, my honourable friend for that intervention. There is no in effect about it. The word war crime is bandied about really quite often. But dropping a bomb in a hospital at Chapter 35, I think, is it the Geneva Convention's sort of book for? It is absolutely specifically forbidden. There is no interpretation. And yet, for the last year and a half, it has become the key or one of the key de facto means of war in Syria. 
Since March, I'm just going to turn briefly to Russia now as well, because I want to suggest some ideas to the Minister. Since March, the Government has been very sensible and robust in the measures it's taken. However, I believe there are some additional ideas, which I've outlined in an article today, which I think would be useful for the Government to consider in dealing with primarily the Russian threat, but also more generally the subversive threat in the United Kingdom or to the United Kingdom. First, we need to systematically expose what the Kremlin is doing, not on an ad hoc basis through the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and other, foreign, and other committees, but by setting up a small, permanent, multi-agency group whose role is to understand and expose these subversive activities. In the 1970s and the United 80s, the United States had this. It was called the Active Measures Working Group and was reckoned to be extremely successful in investigating and exposing Russian or then Soviet subversive activities. And by subversive, they called it active measures in those days, but it was assassination, propaganda, smears, blackmail, and all these other forms of sort of spies warfare with the occasional support to terrorist groups, etc., etc. Um, I believe we need such a group now. It doesn't have to be big, and it can be seconded from other government departments. But I do believe we need something more than ad hoc. Secondly, we need to introduce a list of PR agents, reputation management firms, and others who work as agents for Russian influence in the UK, even dir either directly or via proxies or third parties. Thirdly, we need to consider laws that introduce a sort of health warning on broadcasters. A counter-propaganda bill, Madam Deputy Speaker, is going through Congress to do just that, and we need to consider the same. Fourthly, as I've mentioned, we need to properly fund the World Service TV and radio, and specifically the Russian service. Fifth, I'd argue we need to look at, we need to look at our regi visa regime anyway, and I know that my colleagues on the Foreign Affairs Committee are extremely concerned about the visa regimes. And regarding Russia and Ukraine and Kazakhstan and other states, from the former Soviet bloc. We make it very easy for oligarchs, basically kleptocrats, to come here, and very difficult for ordinary people to come here. I believe that we should make it much easier for ordinary Ruskies and ordinary Ukrainians, Azerbaijanis and Kazakhstanis, to come here if, you know, if we judge them to be decent to do so, and much more difficult for the people who have stolen their money in the first place to come over here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Sick. So, we need to flip this system around. Sixth, the FCO needs to be more active in seeing the Russian influence in the round. My, my honourable friend expertly has ever raised the point of Nord Stream 2. This is not just a commercial venture, but is a critical piece of geopolitical politics which will affect Europe for years to come. We should have been much more active. Do you want me to give a... Yeah. My honourable friend is making an absolute key point on this pipeline, and may I say... But he's not just making this point about this pipeline, but when we see one of our important European partners inviting a dictator to the wedding of the foreign minister, seeing them dancing together as though he was some sort of champion of freedom and a partner of choice, and then at the end of the dance to see the foreign minister, the foreign minister of a NATO power, of a European partner, Curtsy to a murderous dictator, we have to ask ourselves what is happening in our neighbourhood under our watch. I completely agree with what uh, my honourable friend said. Uh, our glorious Prime Minister may not be as good a dancer as Putin, but I would rather have her as our leader. Uh, uh, um, seventh. Give Ofcom greater powers. The Latvian government, Madam Deputy Speaker, regularly highlights the negative content of Russian broadcasters based in London who spew propaganda into the Baltics. I don't believe that we should sh sh uh, close these people down, or Russia Today or Sputnik, who turn out a regular diet of anti-Western nonsense. But we need to strengthen fines, rights of reply, and ensure Ofcom investigates these uh, potential uh, offences more quickly. Eighth. We need to use financial and legal powers to hurt those people around him. I've talked to the security minister. I'm aware that things are in the pipeline and are happening, so watch this space. Ninth, we need to look at conventional deterrence as well. Russia's political and financial dealings with the West are part of a multifaceted strategy. So we need to relearn the art of deterrence, both for conventional weaponry and for non-conventional conflict as well. It's better to be robust now than it, uh, to, frankly, encourage the sort of adventurism that we are now seeing. Maybe we should have been robust 10 years ago. And 10th, we need to understand the threat to our electoral system by cyber infiltration and fake news. We have seen how divisive disputed elections are in the United States. 
and there is little doubt that the Russians had an extremely sophisticated operation going back to 2014 to begin the process of manipulating by breaking into uh, cyber breaking into um, election state boards by backing people around Trump, by attacking Hillary Clinton, by understanding the Democrat strategy, by stealing the information from their servers. So it wasn't just a case of embarrassing the Clinton campaign, it was more sophisticated and far more malign. And indeed, we have cyber attacks and cyber problems here. Um, I declare that I wrote, the, uh, I wrote a definition of Russian warfare for the Henry Jackson Society. Henry Jackson Society has about 440 brute force attacks on its website per month, a lot of these coming from Russian IPs. There are regular Russian attacks on Dr. Alexander Foxel, who is their excellent Russia expert. Um, And so we are seeing these attacks, probably from Russia, maybe from other more sophisticated state actors, on think tanks in the United Kingdom. And the Henry Jackson Society has hosted, as well as myself, uh, rather more importantly probably for Mr. Putin, uh, Bill Browder, uh, and also the wonderful Marina Litvinenko as well. So I think we should be wary of what the Russians and others are doing here and elsewhere. And this is why this is a global problem. And in this new kind of political conflict we're facing from these authoritarian states, hackers and assassins and trolls, as well as market manipulators and criminals, are more useful maybe than conventional forms of warfare. I will leave it there, Madam Deputy Speaker. I apologise if I've spoken a little bit too long. Um, But I would appreciate very much the Minister's thoughts on uh, both Global Britain and some of those suggestions. Thank you. Paul Masterson.